Good to see you guys here tonight. Sorry I didn't see you last week. Enough said. <laughs> but let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. And we pray that your spirit will fill this place, that each person here will be filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that you will teach each of us what we need to hear out of this lesson and that you will use it for our good and for your glory. Please keep our minds, our thoughts on you and your word. Anything that comes from our selfish and prideful nature, expose to us and lovingly take it away. And anything from the enemy we expect is far from this place at this time. We thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we pray in the name of the one who showed us what love is, Jesus Christ, amen. I, like Lee, prefer to read the entire scripture before I start to teach. I'm also very appreciative of Lee for covering for me last week and doing an excellent job leading you through the first part of Acts 4. And I will start with verse 23 and read to the end of chapter 4. So starting at verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that they raised their voice to God, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were, who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things they were sold, that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, last week you learned of the boldness of Peter and John in the face of imprisonment, threats, and persecution from the Sanhedrin and the high priest. These two were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but even more were showing by their actions both the power and the truth of that resurrection. These guys had been cowering in an upper room after the crucifixion of Christ. They were scared that the guards would come and take them away and crucify them as well. Until the resurrection of Christ, there was going to be no Christianity, no followers of Christ. They would have died off. 
But these guys and all those that followed him and saw him, saw the truth, knew that he was God, and preached it boldly. So this is not the same Peter and John that we know in the Gospels. They were changed by what had happened. And they were now standing before the same people that had brought about the crucifixion of Jesus. They showed no fear. They stood up against them to the point of accusing them of being the ones that had his blood on their hands. And they attributed all of the healing to Jesus Christ, or the healing that had just happened. We should expect them to be severely beaten or killed for this boldness. But the timid ones now were the rulers. They were fearful of Jesus Christ. Another witness to the fact that the resurrection was real. John and Peter defiantly say they will and must continue bearing witness to Jesus. The rulers then threatened them some more, which had to look pretty feeble since they didn't do anything related to the first threats they issued. And after that response, they let them go. Now, what do they do in response to this huge victory? And this is where one, most of the learning I received during studying this came from. Let's read it again. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They celebrated by going to their friends who had been praying and were certainly very concerned for them. They told them what had happened and then they prayed to God. Is that your first response when something goes well in your life? Prayer. I'll often throw up a quick, you know, thank God, and I mean it, but shouldn't we be actually thanking God rather than just throwing up a trivialized cliche? Let's look at the prayer and dissect it a bit. First, it's a group prayer. Sharing the victory with friends in Christ. And we have no record of Peter and John claiming any credit for themselves in this whole passage. Like we are prone to do. But there is no, look what God did through me. Has anybody else been guilty of saying that? Or even thinking it? You don't have to raise your hand. And while that is true, they did, God did use Peter and John that's not where they pointed, not to themselves. Because that always takes some of the focus off of God, off of the Lord. We see no jealousy from the friends. No indication that, boy, I wish I was there too, and I would have done a great job too. That's another thing that kind of hit me in looking at this, because that's often me, you know. I love that Carson was there praying for somebody and they were miraculously healed, but dang, I wasn't there that afternoon. Anybody done that? Sorry, Carson, that was, shouldn't point you out, but that's one that I have actually felt. So there was no apparent jealousy. Did you have something to add? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. You're get, giving credit where it's due. They begin their prayer with adoration and praise and recount God's might and his sovereignty. As PK, P, P, K, P, I'm trying to go to PT, PK was teaching Sunday, we heard about prayer and thanksgiving, praise should be an integral part of our prayers. It's not because God needs to hear about how great he is but because we need to acknowledge it. 
constantly. If not, we slide into that trap of, it's about me. But it's not, it's about God. The next part is actually quoting scripture from the Old Testament that refers to both the vanity and pride of men. It points out the opposition that's inherent in our fallen nature. Most of our battles are with ourselves. When we read, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things, the kings of the earth took their stand, I won't say cry out because I sing that occasionally in the Messiah, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed one. It's easy to think of this as being them. You know, that's the rulers of the earth, that isn't me. That's all those vain people, that's, well, maybe that is me, but this looks like it's accusing others, but if you look at it closely, you can find yourself in there. Now, if you're doing that and saying it's them, not us, let me give you a little bit of an example of our vanity there. And I lost my place. If you had power and you had influence, would you not do whatever you could to hold on to it? And we do have power and influence, but it's through God. But in the earthly sense, if you had power, if you had money, you had influence, are you not going to do what you must to keep it, to hold on to it tightly? That's what these leaders are being accused of. And that is really in each one of us. Whatever we do in our own power is vain. Solomon wrote, wrote a whole book about it, and if you ever want to feel humble, read Lamentations. I'm plotting a vain thing right now. I got half my grass mowed yesterday before it got too dark. So I'm trying to figure out how, how and when I'm going to mow the rest of my lawn. That's kind of in opposition to God's law. The grass is going to grow, right? We keep whacking it down and it grows back. Seems like a fairly vain, fruitless effort to me, but I keep doing it so my wife won't complain about the grass. So it's totally <laughs> self-serving. But we do so many vain things in our life that it would really be hard to keep track of them. And if you do too much introspection on that, you're going to want to go ahead and hurry home to heaven, so you'll quit. All this is to point out that God alone is good, and God alone deserves glory and honor and praise. The passage does specifically refer to the opposition to Christ that brought about the crucifixion. That is what they're talking about. But it also gives us insight into our own sinful nature. There are many layers to the onion that we have in the Holy Scriptures. You can read the same passage a hundred times and get something out of it each time and not necessarily the same thing. And we want to keep that in mind. Once you say, oh, I read that already, I know it, I got it, you're heading towards Phariseeism, not towards someone surrendered to Christ. Oh, let's see. Did the onions, let's throw out a, another little metaphor. If you read the Bible with guidance from the Holy Spirit, you can mine many gems in the same places. And that's my two quick metaphors for the night, and I'll try to quit. I think in the great speaking classes, they tell you to limit those, but I never listened when I was learning how to speak publicly. The next part of the prayer is supplication. That's asking God for what they want or what we want. Let's read on again at verse 29. 
Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What really struck me in this request is that the closest thing they do to asking for protection is merely asking God to look on their threats. We often pray for safety, for protection, for ourselves and for others. And that's not wrong, but that's not in here. This prayer doesn't go there at all. In fact, it almost seems like the opposite. You know, throw me into the battle, Lord. It's a sort of a, yeah, they've threatened us, big deal. You see it, Lord. Now allow us to defy them. That's really in that prayer. They're asking to be defiant. Grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. That's what they were told not to do. Not to preach in the name of Jesus. And by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They're asking God to allow them to boldly charge into the battle. How often do we pray that prayer? Much more often I'd say I'm asking, praying, and seeing if it's okay for me to sneak back to the back lines because I feel beat up. Nothing compared to what these guys suffered through. Once again, we also see them giving all the credit where it's due for what will be accomplished to the power is to, goes to the power of God, and they expect it to happen. I was sort of surprised it's not even their hands that will be reaching out, but it's God's hand that will be reaching out to heal them. And all of it is through the name of Jesus. Their outcome of their prayer was immediate, and it was impressive. The place shook. Was there an earthquake? Maybe. Did the Holy Spirit descend again? Yeah. And that could shake a place up quite a bit. I'd like to see us shake it up that way. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Their prayer was answered with an emphatic yes from God. They asked to speak God's word boldly, and they did. And if they hadn't, we probably wouldn't have this in the Bible. Continuing in verse 32, we have a repetition, something we see in the scriptures fairly often, and it's an emphasis of how important something is. So, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say anything that any of the things, oops, sorry, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Earlier, they prayed in one accord. A joke we sometimes hear. How'd they all fit in one accord? Now, as those hearing and believing that are of one heart and one soul, and that's important. It's a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you think you know, that's what brings us to being of one accord, one heart, being filled. I think so. Is being of one mind and spirit an indication of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Again, for believers, I think so. And in this case, it is. The tougher question for me was kind of the reverse of this. And I'm not going to answer it with any definitive response there, but I want you to think about this. Is not being of one mind and spirit an indication of not being filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm not really willing to go that far to say that, but I think it's hard to be full of the Holy Spirit and be in discord with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we need to look to that 
and ask God to reveal what's his desire and what's our nature in those situations. Um, I do agree with Henry Blackaby sort of dancing around this. He's a man that's probably had the biggest impact on my spiritual journey outside of Jesus Christ, of course, or any other biblical figures. There's a few of those that have impacted me greatly. John comes to mind first. But, but Henry Blackaby, for anybody that doesn't know him, is a Southern Baptist that got out of the Southern Baptist bunch and started his own ministry, but he wrote a book called Experiencing God and a whole lot of other ones along those lines. And it's basically how to know and do the will of God. But he had a tiny church. He was called the Saskatoon, Alaska. He was a, a Alaska, Canada. He was a native of Canada, but at the time he was in sunny California, had a good church. Things were going well. The world would say, stay there, dummy. You don't need to go to the middle of nowhere in, in Canada. At that time I started to say Canada. But in Saskatoon, he went to this church that was basically dying. There were maybe a dozen people left in the church. And people would say to him afterward, oh, those must have been the godliest people on earth. And he said, no, the ones that were left were the distilled essence of why the church was dying in the first place. They were all ornery, all had different ideas of what needed to happen. And that church came very close to shutting down. But what he did in that place was became a true pastor. He would talk people through the problems they were in. He took those 12, and they wouldn't do anything until they agreed on it. Now, those folks had never agreed on anything, but he relied on the Holy Spirit to change them and bring them into submission to God as opposed to doing what they wanted. And making, maybe too late, but making a long story short, from that small church grew an evangelistic movement all across Canada. Hundreds of churches were planted. A, a seminary was formed. And it really had its birth in that tiny dying church. And his method of working with people was bringing them to God and letting God work on them to get them in the one accord, in the joining together with the like mind. All righty. Now I'm completely lost because I've been talking and I printed it too small for me. So, all righty, let's see. There's where I lost Henry. Okay, sorry. Man is in a fallen state and agreeing and being in, in a place where we all are of the same mind requires the Holy Spirit. Now, yeah, I think a bunch of really awful folks in the flesh could get together and agree on doing something that's ungodly. So that's not the only thing we're looking for there. But it is something that we can't accomplish anything. If you derail my thought, I'll crash. If we can't accomplish anything, or if we can't accomplish anything, it's going to be through being unified in the Holy Spirit and following God. Okay. <laughs> sure.
they brought that chorus into play along with some other verses. I don't have it right now, but I can't remember it. Where it says, once you're attached to the Ask me a tough question. Uh, <laughs> Is that what you're saying, like the one saved always saved? And well, that and there, there are scriptures in the Bible like, no one can pluck you from God's hand. Right. And then there are also verses that say, this will remove you from the book of life. Are they both true? Yes. How do we reconcile them? Only God knows, and I mean that literally. There's plenty of discussion about it, and I know I'm going to get an opinion, and that's fine. <laughs> but we really don't know. The one thing I feel certain about in that realm is that if you are concerned about losing your salvation, you won't. Those that are complete despots that, and they may have said the prayer somewhere down the line, and I'm not going to get into the weird speculation of, well, they didn't really mean it or not. I'm assuming they meant it when they said it. But if we don't walk with Jesus, then meeting him and saying hi on the way doesn't mean we're his followers. So while I absolutely believe in saying the sinner's prayer, we all need to do that. I do it every Sunday and every Thursday and I'm okay with repeating it because I've sinned between every Sunday and Thursday and Sunday and Thursday but God has forgiven me of all of my sins that's the ones I've committed in the past the ones I'm committing right now by lying to you guys <laughs> the ones I'll commit in the future I, I love what another one of my favorite guys said one time. He said, half of what I tell you is the truth, half of it's wrong, but I can't tell you which half is which. <laughs> uh, Johnny, what did you have to say there? Uh, I was happy to see you nodding your head yes there. <laughs> I like that take on the possibility. I also thought, you know, if you're resisting the government, it may just feel like you're going to hell or you're there, but that's not going to condemn you there. But I'm, I like your explanation better than mine. We always want to obey God above all other authorities. But as long as they're not in conflict with God, we are called to respect and obey the authority in our lives. Well, see, I believe that we're, for the most sake, right here, it's one of the things that I've mentioned to um, one of the persons that I'm ministering to. I said, you know, if, if I made the confession of my sins, um, if you remember Jesus Every single time he healed somebody or forgave somebody, he said, go and what? Well, said, said no more was a popular if one. If you continue sinning, if you continue on the same path, then maybe you should be asking your question if you're saved or not. Not if you lost your salvation. But if you ever had it. If you ever had it, instead of saying, hey, I lost it, well, maybe you never had it. Because maybe you never walked away from, from, your, from your sin. I, I like the other verses in the Bible that say if we have proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord, then we are saved. That's the short version, and there's several of them that 
go along those lines. Yeah. And this is why he, had, as a teenager, he kicked my butt in Israel on the, the quizzes. Just... But, <laughs> but don't doubt your salvation unless you weren't sincere in asking Jesus into your heart. He wants to say something. I can see it. Tom, you don't want to say something? Okay. You look like you're ready for it. <laughs> All right, let me get somewhere back on track here. And actually, that might be a pretty good lead-in to the next little bit, which does have to do to, with government. The second part of that verse and the rest of the chapter cover another very interesting concept. It's one that's particularly alien in our culture of free market and consumption. So let's read that again real quick. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds, excuse me, of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. <gasps> Isn't that communism? Well, strictly speaking, yes, sort of. One definition of communism is it's a system of social organization based on the holding of all property in common, actual ownership being ascribed to the community as a whole or to the state, and that's where it falls down. A somewhat better description is communalism, which is the principle or practice of communal ownership. It can include a strong allegiance to one's own group rather than to society as a whole. And you may be thinking, especially if you were aware of what happened in the 60s, I don't know, maybe one person was aware of the 60s, and I've been told if you remember the 60s, you weren't really there. But, but here it is. Oh boy, the Bible wants us to be hippie commies. Those, when I were, was growing up in school, were fighting words. It actually is a beautiful way to live. And in this case, it has a beautiful outcome for a while till next week when we get into the next chapter. Sadly, it requires that same Holy Spirit, or it does require it. I guess it's sad that the only way you can pull it off is with the Holy Spirit, bringing us into one accord to be at that level of sharing everything that we have. And our society is dead set against this. If we can live, the real point here is we need to live recognizing the truth that everything, including ourselves, belongs to God. We have nothing we can take credit for. And the flip side of that would be kind of nice. We have nothing we can take blame for. But that's only because we have Jesus. If you're Without Jesus, you're to be pitied because you get all the blame, none of the credit, ultimately. And that's part of why we need to be out telling people about him. That, and we were asked to, actually commanded to, but we'll say it nicely. If we can live recognizing that everything belongs to God, it frees us from being possessed by our possessions or by our natures. I mean, we say, well, you know, I'm, I'm tall. I, I can reach the top shelf and you can't, nah, nah, nah. That's God. I have no credit for that. 
our level of intelligence. We can figure out the most complex math problems. Where's the credit to that go? You can't answer that one. Who gets credit for not being able to, well, I used to be able to, you know, do complex math equations in my head? God. That was a gift. Was I proud of it? Heck yeah. Am I still? Not as much as I used to be, because it's not as great a gift. But, <laughs> but we, yeah, and, and we all have different talents. Playing a guitar. I took two years of piano lessons and never really got past the finger drills. I can't do much with these. But he picked it up, what, a year and a half, two, three years ago? Fourth year. That's another thing you lose with age is time expands and compresses, so you really can't figure out how long anything has been. But we get... Next week, we are going to see the ugly size, the ugly outcome that comes from slipping into our flesh. And when we do that with our gifts, our talents, our possessions, anything that we get possessive of turns into an idol. And God is in the business of destroying idols. So be careful with that. All righty, I lost my time thingy. I guess that works pretty well. Let's do a bullet review of the points that I did jot down, and there were some others we made, but then we'll pray and chat a little more and or dismiss. First thing, we are to boldly proclaim Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and we do it in our words and in our actions. And often our actions speak much louder than our words. Second one, we are to proclaim to our friends, at least our friends in faith, and thank God in prayer for the victories in our lives. We should take no credit but proclaim His glory and his providence in our lives. We want to pray with adoration and thanksgiving and to be filled with the Holy Spirit for boldness, for unity, and to act according to God's will, not our own. And I find myself praying often for my will be done. And thankfully, God rarely, if ever, answers those positively. Our unity in the Spirit includes recognizing all we are and all we have belongs to God. And, we should be, and it all should be available to Him to use in any way He desires. And again, most of my time, I suspect most of your time, is spent pursuing your will more than God's. It certainly is in my life. All right, let us pray together through the Holy Spirit as one in heart and soul, and then we'll answer questions after praying. Loving Father, we repent of our timidity. These men went boldly before the rulers that could have had them killed and proclaimed Jesus when they were forbidden not to. And Lord, we need that boldness in our lives. We need to seek you, to seek your will, and to tell everyone we can about your life, your death, and most importantly, your resurrection and who you are. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. 
and know that you'll continue to grow us as we allow it and as we seek you. And Lord, we can, we can slide backwards. You don't love us any less. We can do great things totally surrendered to you and you don't love us anymore. You loved us as much as was possible through the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so, Lord, we can't earn anything, but we've been given everything. And let us live in the humility of knowing that, to extend grace as we've received it, to extend forgiveness as we've received it, to not run away when things get scary, but to boldly go in your will and in your Holy Spirit to wherever you would lead us. And Lord, we look forward to the day when we can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. But until that time, Lord, let us surrender to you so that we can be good and we can be faithful as Jesus was. And Lord, we pray in the power of his holy name, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord, our Savior, our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>